All right. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Uh, for those who haven't met me before, I'm, I'm Sam Brown. I'm the organizer of this event. Uh, and this is Matt McKay, the organizer of this event. If you haven't met him before, he's been in and out. He's, uh, he's quite the traveler, even though and I'm more centered around this area, so I'm at all of them so far. Um, normally, I hope people like to sit down now, but everybody is already in their seat nicely, uh, nicely settled, so appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate it. Um, first off, uh, thank you to AOL for, for hitting the trifecta this time. We've got a speaker, food, and venue. That's uh, sometimes rare, but they, they hit this one. So definitely want to give them an opportunity to come up and uh, talk a little bit about AOL. Scott, want to come uh, talk about AOL real quick? For as long as you want. Hi, I'm Scott Hoagland. I'm the tech manager here at AOL. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. Um, like you said, the beer, the, the food, please partake. Um, so here at AOL, um, you may think of us as the as the old technology, but you should be aware that we have a lot of cool stuff that we do. Um, at the same time, we deal with this, some old technology, but we use new technology to maintain and handle and move forward. So we do some exciting things. Some of the things that we do here in Dulles, um, we work uh, with marketing, so we do a lot of marketing pages. The identity and registration process is all is all done through here. Um, billing is all done in, through here in Big Room. Um, we'll, we'll talk some about the APIs and, and, and how we use for his CI/CD stuff to go to go up. Um, but we we play with all kinds of different technology: Java, Node, PHP, all kinds of different stuff. Um, we have several openings. We're hiring. We're growing, so that's great. So some of the some of the job positions that we have, um, we have two front end development positions that will be working on AOL.com. Um, if you guys have any information about that, you can come talk to me uh, if you have any interest. We have um, an ETL opening on our, on our billing side. We need a senior Android developer. We, we're looking for a person to do that. Um, uh, we, that so that's a great position. Um, we also have um, several op openings. Um, where's Aaron? Sorry. Right. You can talk to. I was telling one of my old things back here in the back. <laughs> Sorry. So he's got he's got openings that he, you can talk with him about. Um, but you know it's it's uh, it, one thing that I could say. I've been working for AOL for almost 20 years, and my, my friend Terry here is in the same boat. It's it's always changing. It's always exciting. Um, we, do, we do some some really cool things, and the people that we work with are awesome. And so, uh, think of us when, when you think of the technology in this area. So, welcome, enjoy, and uh, there we go. Yeah, thanks a lot, Scott. Appreciate it. Awesome. Really a big thanks. It's it's, uh, it's nice to companies. I know we kind of work on uh, on goodwill, so to have somebody sponsor sponsor the group um, and provide a speaker is, is we really appreciate it. So, uh, big thanks to AOL. This is great. Um, I talk about this every time. This time I actually did remember the stickers. So if you don't have a sticker and you want a sticker, or if you lost your sticker and you need a new sticker, or if you got your sticker dirty, I'll have to see how dirty it is to give you a new one, but you can show it to me. Um, but like I always say, if you want a sticker, please come talk to me. Don't, uh, I'm not gonna like leave them out. Um, at least come introduce yourself and say hi, just so I, I know who you are. And if I see a future meetup, so I'll know who you are. So um, I'll give my stickers. Um, I've tried to find some more upcoming conferences, but I think because it's the end of the year, um, there's not quite as many conferences going on. A lot just happened like, in the last two weeks. Um, so the ones I found that are coming up is uh, Lisa, which is the uh, Linux System Administrators Conference in Seattle, Washington. Um, it looks relevant to this group. It's got systems engineering, security, culture, DevOps, and monitoring and metrics. Um, you know, this conference has been around a really long time, and it's a very high quality conference. So if those are topics that you're at all interested in, um, I think that this is a good conference for, for you to attend. Um, and Seattle's obviously never been at this go. Um, and then O'Reilly Velocity, um, that just happened recently in New York, and then also in California. But if you are looking to get outside of the United States, just because it's more fun that way, um, it's going to be in Barcelona, Spain, coming in uh, up in uh, November. So uh, get your expense. I um, like to do this every time for anybody who's uh, looking for a job, although I don't know if I've ever had anybody stand up and say that they're looking for a job. They're afraid they'll get caught, and we are filming, 
So if you stand up, you may be on film saying that you're looking for a job. So I don't know if I'm going to recommend that, but that's completely up to you. Uh, but if you are hiring people, uh, just like Scott just mentioned, um, if you have job openings, feel free to raise your hand um, and stand up and uh, pitch your job opening. So Scott mentioned it, in my organization, we also work, I, mean, I work at AOL, we were looking for a sort of high scale, low latency uh, experience job opening in a number of other areas, Python developers, or actually CXP automation technology. So we work on a wide <coughs> swath of things services, cloud APIs, internal and public, so if you're interested in any of those sorts of technologies, we have probably some small things that if you're, if you're good, uh, please stop by and you know, I'll, I'll you. Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, I was Yes. My name is Joe Corbeck. I'm with Katie Mann. We both work at a company called InfoZap. Uh, we also have been doing quite a bit of CICD uh, yeah, work. Mostly for uh, USCIS, we're on a project called the, the TIX, which stands for Transformation Integration and Configuration Services. Um, it's a lot of the standard stuff. We have Jenkins, Nexus. Um, it's people are right now. We work with Chef to do some of the delivery portion. Um, it is a project which is headed by a CIO named Mark Schwartz. His whole outlook is to try to fundamentally change the way that the government does software development. And um, we've also, uh, as a company, have done other big work. We took the NASA.gov site, we put that all on the cloud, it's all on the AWS as well. We are hiring, that's why Katie's here, so we'll talk a little bit about what we're looking for. I have lots of information if you'd like to learn more about the positions. We're actually offering some sign-up bonuses if anybody wants to learn more about that. And I have information about the company and the benefit. Give me my card. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Anybody else? Billy? Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Billy. I work at a company called Data Tactics. We do a lot of cool stuff. Um, I would really want to tell you more about my project that does cyber operations stuff. I also work for uh, Data Tactics, it's owned by L3, and we've got a lot of positions there too. So if you're interested in doing cool stuff, come talk to me afterwards. Thank you, sir. My name is Tom Robinson. I work for a startup called IDME out in Tyson's Corner, and we are Rail Shop and New Shack. So that's what we do. We're looking for great people. Thank you. My name is Alex. I work for Texas. I'm developed like the Java and I demo space for a bunch of commercial and government clients. So we have about 50 to 100 openings right now on CIC Digital. Java, we do other things in the lab, but this is not anything. So everyone in this room can switch jobs. <laughs> everyone. You're all, all covered. Everybody. See, that's why you have these meetings, right? Uh, anybody else? Uh, so I work for Twilio. Uh, if you want to move to California, uh, that's where our headquarters is in San Francisco at Mountain View. We do uh, DevOps on an immutable architecture on top of AWS, one of AWS's largest customers. Uh, so whenever we spin up new servers, we never touch those servers. We simply destroy them and spin up new ones behind them. So we're doing that constantly throughout the day, deployments uh, multiple times a day. So as far as cutting edge uh, cloud environments go, uh, it's probably at the uh, furthest end of the spectrum towards uh, the absolute latest and greatest. Um, but if you're not looking to move to California, what I usually do is I just pick one of my favorite startups. So tonight I'll just pick Track Maven. Track Maven is a Series A, six million dollar round, uh, six million dollar Series A round funded company. They are on top of AWS, generally looking for DevOps plus Python, and they are located in Dupont. They're absolutely one of my favorite uh, companies. They do competitive marketing analytics. Um, very cool company. So if you're in Python, talk to me and I'll point you in the right direction. Um, if you're interested in the tech startup space, I generally like to help companies that are um, Series A or before. Um, so I have plenty of uh, information about that in area of the market. Like, like this guy. So I was going to say, what about my that, that Natural segue into. All right, thanks. So I'll go last for everybody else. So, um, I work for a small startup called Inbound Crowd, and by small, I mean I'm the tech person on board, although I'm not one of the founders, 
I am the only uh, technical resource. Um, it's a company of four. Uh, we're in the healthcare space. Uh, we're using Node.js, Angular, um, Heroku, CodeShip, um, and a bunch of other awesome modern technologies. So if you're looking to get in the Node.js space and you want to be the second engineering hire, it's an awesome uh, title to have. Um, not as good as first, but it's up there. Um, yeah, come talk to me afterwards, and I'll tell you all about what we do. Um, it's, uh, I think we're going to be going into sales mode here pretty soon, um, and lots of lots of awesome stuff. So, anybody else? I said it was last week. Okay, awesome. All right, thanks everybody. Appreciate that. Um, upcoming events. Holy crap! Um, so. We are extremely fortunate right now to have a ridiculous backlog of speakers, and not just any speakers, uh, what I think is a great list of speakers coming up. Um, so in November, um, Alan Sandy from IBM, who's sitting in the back here, um, date TBD, hopefully we're going to figure that out here at the, uh, after the meeting, um, and location to be determined, but probably Arlington, D.C. area, but we'll, we can talk about that and, and figure it out. Um, Agile teams don't just move the bottleneck, I think it's relevant to almost everybody in here. Um, December 4th, uh, Grant Fritchie from Red Game Software will be here to talk about database migrations, which seems to come up all the time in continuous delivery as one of those really tough problems to solve. So I think this will be a great meetup. Um, yeah, I was going to say, Grant is coming in from London. Uh, so he reached out to us, and we actually have a lot of mutual connections. So I think that's going to be awesome because that is like the number one question about DevOps and continuous deployment is how do you get to build with you? So that one actually will be. <laughs> Uh, that's right. Tra tra okay. Yeah. Tra so I know it says location TBD, but I think that just got locked down recently. Yeah. So um, that will be in Dupont Circle in Washington DC. Um, obviously. <coughs> um, third week in December. This is tentative. Uh, still have to confirm this with Mike, who is the former organizer of this group, who moved out to California to join some company I've never heard of. Um, but he's going to potentially come out here in the third week. Um, which is funny because exactly a year ago we had a gentleman from Netflix come out and talk about their build tools. So I think Mike may come out and do a similar talk from his perspective at Netflix, uh, which would be awesome because he's obviously got you know, worked out here for a while and has been at Netflix for, for a little while. So I'm um, hoping to schedule that in the third week of December, date and location to be determined. Um, January, uh, I talked about this last time, appetize.io um, by Tim Marchinsky. He's going to talk about an app that he wrote, which is an app deployment on top of Docker containers, which is drag and drop, so you can drag a zip file on top of the app in a browser, and it will automatically deploy your application to a container, which is pretty awesome. I've never seen that before. Uh, but he showed me a demo, and I thought he should share it with everybody. So, um, you know, if you're learning the, want to look, learn more about Docker um, and things like that, I think this would be a great talk. Uh, February 18th, uh, best practices for cloud orchestration, management, group governance, and cost governance and cost visibility um, of Strato. Uh, we haven't figured out exactly who the speaker is going to be from them yet, but um, lined up tentatively for February 18th. Um, March, um, using ThoughtWorks Go for continuous delivery. Um, I'm sure most people in here use Jenkins. It's uh, definitely the choice du jour, but um, Go has recently gained a little more popularity because they open sourced it. So. Um, one of Billy's coworkers is going to be talking about that in March, Kurt Yoder. Uh, and then in April, um, Affian recently contacted me to have a presentation out at their headquarters in Reston. Um, and they're going to do a CD presentation. We didn't want to quite put the subject down yet because that's pretty far away. Um, so we'll try and make it more relevant to what they're doing in you know the early, early 2015 timeframe. Um, but that all being said, um, I'm still looking for speakers. I'm always looking for speakers. Having uh, a long backlog is awesome, and number one, it's not showing really up in green, maybe, but it is in green because I still have nobody in .NET. Does anybody here do .NET? Anybody? You do .NET? Yes. All right, we have to talk. <laughs> See if you want to do a presentation. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to talk to you two guys afterwards. Need a, need a .NET presentation. Uh, we've still not had one here in continuous delivery. That is a shame, honestly. Um, the other things I always talk about, federal DevOps is huge in this area, obviously, culture versus tools. Uh, if you want to talk about a particular tool, which we have some talks about, but also culture, which we had more of, I think, kind of like last summer. Um, and we haven't had as many recently, one or two, but um, those always go over really well. Um, war stories, you know, how you fought through something and you got through it in continuous delivery. Cloud, obviously, is somewhat popular these days. Um, and then startups, I think, is a more recent thing where there's starting to be a few more startups in D.C. Um, we're trying to connect with more of them and have them come out and talk about how they're doing 
kind of continuous delivery from the start instead of bolting it onto an enterprise where it perhaps didn't exist before, but maybe standing it up from the beginning, how, how they're getting that started. Um, or, the or the one that was really good was uh, switching from platform as a service on to virtual as a service, like moving from Heroku to AWS, why would you want to do that? And what scale would you do that one a few months ago, which was really good. Absolutely. Um, I think that's about all for me. I've talked enough. Uh, let's welcome Vikram Kadang from AOL. Most of the core features we want to test, and then 
uh, to try to uh, send it off to QA. So that was our initial attempt. Uh, so what happened was the build took a long, long time. Uh, so the reason the build took a long time is because most of the testing is like integration testing. So you start off in the uh, beginning and it used to take like an hour or more than an hour before it finished. finished. So it was like a long feedback loop. So, so what happened is uh, developers started to ignore the test. Sometimes they even skip the test because they want to get some stuff into QBA fast. Uh, that basically wasn't uh, what you like. Uh, so, so that leads to this basically. That's one of the one of the most favorite articles basically. That's, uh, uh, so if you want to slack off, that's a perfect example. Because if my code is compiling, I can't get it. So another observation that we had was we were building these huge monolithic applications that contain basically it contained the uh, front end UI layer consisting of either JSPs or Elastic Template modules or any of this uh, uh, front end stuff. And then in the service layer, we were also doing a lot of services, um, including billing, catalog services, and stuff like that, which talked to multiple databases, multiple packet servers. Everything was in one profile, which basically meant that it was very hard to scale. So if you want to do scale the application, we had to scale everything or nothing. So all of, we had to just do all of them. Um, so, and also that also meant that when initially when we build something on let's say JDK5, we are stuck to it. So it's a long term commitment. Uh, so if you want to use like JDK8 features like lambdas or something like that, we're basically stuck because we can't do any other stuff unless the whole application uh, moves to that and then there's a long cycle. And again, another feature, another thing that we observed was the code coverage by test was always 30% or less. No matter what we did to uh, do like a lot of testing, it, it was still low. And the main reasons were like the code contains contained methods that have like high cyclomatic complexity. So when I say cyclomatic complexity, it basically means each method has so many branches in it, like, like switch statements, if statements, throw try, catch, all the statements, one method. So to write test cases for that, those kind of methods, you basically need, let's say you have 10, um, factor of 10, you have to write like 10 different test cases to go through all the scenarios, and they're basically testing the, all the branches. So mo most of the developers basically, they would write test cases to test the core features. Once they write the, test the core, core features, they say, okay, my code is good, and, and all that. So when we looked at the code coverage, it was, it was not even close to what we wanted. And then it was full of, uh, one service was calling in a different service, so it was full of uh, random code. Uh, so everything we had to basically break up the code into smaller pieces, and then all the complex dependencies that will have to be broken. So, so those are the observations we did. So, so we started looking at, um, microservices architecture. So the main uh, point of microservices architecture is basically instead of deploying all your functionality in one big process, you basically break it up into smaller processes and deploy them separately. So in this example, let's say you have feature A that's spread across multiple layers in your application. You basically take all those code out and build it on its own and deploy it. So the advantage with that is if you want to scale out any of these functional functional units, you basically have to just scale that particular unit up. So for example, a like catalog service, let's say, uh, you build a website. So most of the people just come into the main website, which basically needs some sort of a catalog service or content service. So that can be scaled uh, higher. And things like billing or one of the order management will be uh, applicable only when somebody decides to buy something or do something. So those doesn't need to be scaled as big. Well. So you can scale each individual part as you go. So that's one of the advantages of microservices architecture. So, so in our case, so that's our in the simple use case. That was how we were designing our applications before. So we had this big uh, Bobcat uh, deployed WAR file that contained all the services that we are working on. 
So we have the store front UI, we have the catalog service, profile and billing service, talking to multiple databases, and also talking to multiple remote services. So what we did is we, we took a look at it and decided to break it up into smaller, fine-grained services. So it, it looked, started looking something like this. So we have this uh, storefront UI that basically uh, most of the logic is um, built into like uh, JavaScript libraries, like Bootstrap and stuff like that, and it can be rendered on the client uh, customer's machine itself. So we are using the customer's hardware to do all the heavy stuff, heavy lifting stuff. And then we have this backend services, that, uh, like catalog service that was uh, basically uh, deployed as a uh, unit, and then uh, profile service and billing service. Uh, so we were able to, uh, the catalog service, we can deploy as many uh, catalog service models as we want, depending on the room. So, so for example, the billing service could be a lesser, a lesser number of instances, and catalog service could be a lot more instances. So we have the flexibility to basically uh, do those kind of stuff. So, so yes. can I ask a question during the presentation? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So this storefront UI, mm -hmm. is it a web server or is it a client? Uh, it, it's, it's a web server. Uh, it's a, it is a dumb web server. All it did was send some HTML and some JavaScript to the browser. And then the JavaScript called the web services. Oh, so that. And then what is a remote service? A remote service is a backend billing, billing engine uh, that basically goes to all this uh, payment gateways uh, to address cards and stuff like that. So some of the pros of microservices are uh, well known, so you can divide and conquer, so you break down complex problems into small problems, and the code base is small, small enough to fit in your head, so once you open the code base, you know exactly what to look for, where things are, and it's much cleaner to code and debug, and it also enables frequent deployments, because if you are making some changes in one part of the service, you just deploy only that piece, you don't touch any other piece. So that way, the chances of breaking something else is um, lesser compared to deploying the whole thing. Right. And it also enables uh, polyglot programming and persistence. So for example, if you got this web service that basically wants to talk to MySQL database, you can do that. If it wants to talk to Mongo, you can do that. If it wants to talk to something else, you can do that. So and also, we're not just limited to adding just Java applications. Because you can even write uh, Scala applications or even Ruby, Python. As long as it meets certain criteria, uh, you can write uh, any kind of code in any programming language. So, so that's one of the advantages of microservices. Uh, and it, it enables independent scalability, so you can scale each service. And no long-term commitment required. So that's one of the pros, I think. Because let's say you want to use some new features in like Java, you basically rewrite a small piece of service and start using lambdas to it away and rewrite the new one, which will eventually take over. So it's much more easier to do if you do like small ones in small ways. And of course, everything has a con. So this comes with a lot of uh, stuff that's really hard to do. So Dealing with complexity of the system as a whole, like individual parts are simpler, but to deal with the entire system uh, at, the, at the higher level is a little bit more complex. Uh, so you'll have to do a lot of monitoring. Uh, trying to monitor all the services uh, is a little bit more complex than monitoring one application. Uh, so you need a little bit help in that area. Uh, also, so microservices need to be deployed within a container or without a container. So what I mean by that is this, you should be able to run uh, your microservice from your ID, for example, the test. So you can't, uh, uh, you can't afford to just take that, put it in a container, uh, start it up, and then do some testing because it takes a lot of time because there are a lot of services. Uh, once you start doing that, you will get a uh, uh, long development cycle. Uh, so another thing with the microservice is duplication of effort. Because you have all these services, there are some common facets of these services that basically look very similar, 
so you might have a little bit hard time uh, avoiding duplication, but you can always write libraries and use those libraries and all the services that will jump, that you can avoid duplication. Okay. And one of the things uh, we found it hard was the service discovery. So service discovery is basically if you deploy multiple microservices, how do you call those microservices? Uh, how do you discover microservices without using something like an ESP? So that one is a little bit harder. So you need a strategy for the service discovery. So what we did was we had this load balancing, content switching load balancer. So that using that, based on the URI, we just uh, routed the request to a specific microservice. So that way, we were able to uh, use the service discovery feature. But that's one way of doing it, but you could also do it in multiple ways. For example, Netflix guys, they do like uh, different services called like Hystrix, uh, which basically, when they start up, uh, it's like sort of an uh, ESP, but, but not a ESP in the uh, fact that it's much more lightweight when it enables the service discovery. Uh, so you can do that one as well. But, uh, uh, that's one, right? So the last point is, even though doing microservices is simple, that doesn't mean it's easy to do it because writing some simple code is not easy as far as it because it's much more easy writing like a bunch of English kernel statements uh, compared to writing a simple free code without the kernel statements. So that's what I thought. So it takes some time getting used to that. Once we get used to that, then we can start working. So some of the basic requirements for uh, continuous delivery are we need to we needed to make our dev, QA, stage, and production environments look exactly similar, but at a different scale. So that was uh, some first thing that we did. And we also had to make uh, zero downtime deployments. Uh, so that basically means that at a peak time of the day, we should be able to deploy services without so, so, so that that took a little time to do because we had to convert from stateful systems to stateless systems and use NetScaler uh, rotating the services out of NetScaler rotation and then putting them back in. So we took a little bit of time to uh, figure that out. And also <coughs> making sure that testing and deployment are integral parts of our code input. Uh, so that when we deploy a code, it's fully tested. It comes with its own deployment scripts that uh, ops can use to basically deploy. Uh, and another thing is build quality. In. So that basically means when you say requirements, I mean what happens if it doesn't exist? It is in the, it doesn't happen. If the thing doesn't happen, then it's not going. It's not going to go all the way to production. So what ha what will happen is it will stop somewhere in between, and it has to be manually somebody has to manually test it and certify it, and then somebody has to manually push to production. So so when I say continuously deliver, so this basically means when as soon as somebody checks in the code, if it passes all these quality gates, it goes all the way to production if it meets these requirements. And automate everything, build unit testing, integration testing, code coverage and quality analysis. Uh, deployment and acceptance test. So that basically automate from soup to nuts. Kind of so so that, that even means uh, automating your uh, code review as well. So so there are some tools that can do most of the code reviews. I'm going to show that uh, at the later part. And so, so that basically gives us the ability to scale out individual components and we had to do stateless systems and also follow a lot of convention over configuration in our uh, code. So there, there's no more uh, configuring uh, different things. For example, let's say um, start writing some Java web apps. So there's no web XML to that basically says this URIs go to this place. It's, it's all going to be like a request mapping. Uh, this URI in the method itself. So we use the Spring framework, uh, Spring Boot. That, that basically uh, helps us doing uh, conventional configuration. Right? And the other thing is 
come it early and often so that you test early and if it fails, it's a faster feedback loop and then you fix that and then go, uh, go to the next step. And all the triggers are data driven. So there's no manual intervention. So, so the quality gates are based off certain uh, triggers. Uh, so things like okay, it has to meet certain uh, code coverage percentage, then it has to meet a certain uh, code quality uh, percentage, and it has to, there cannot be any skipped unit tests and stuff like that. So everything is data data uh, so to go to the next, next step, essentially. So uh, I think most of you guys probably look, uh, know about this technical uh, delivery book by uh, hum, just Humble and David Farley. So this basically gives you the uh, definition of a delivery pipeline. Uh, so as soon as you check the code in, it triggers and starts the unit test. And if you look at the first uh, first part of it, uh, the first check-in triggered the test and the, and the test failed. So as soon as it failed, you get a feedback, you, and then you go and fix those uh, uh, fix those bugs, and then check the code back in. It goes and passes the unit test, and it then it fails the uh, UAD. <coughs> so it fails the UAD. You, it, again, it triggers a feedback loop where you go and fix those tests, and then it goes all the way uh, to uh, the automated uh, test pass, and then it goes to a release cycle. And so, so they, so this, this is basically the delivery pipeline that has been uh, defined in those. So, how do we implement this uh, delivery pipeline? So, what we did is we basically started slow, uh, and we build parts of it. So, we build the unit test first, and we build the uh, deployment to dev, then test it, then deploy to QA, test it, deploy to stage, test it, deploy to production, and then test it. Again. So, this this is a continuously improving pipeline, uh, which basically we add more and more features. So, do it. So, so currently, yes. So, when you say deploy to dev, is that deployed? So, you're deploying what you built in the first stage. Yes. And so, every time you say deploy, you're deploying the thing you built. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so we build it once, and then push it into an access uh, repository. Uh, so, I'm going to show you the actual library like that. Uh, so, so we have uh, four stages. One is the commit stage. Then we have QA, and then staging, and production. Uh, so the first stage is basically build a unit test, and and once uh, build a unit test passes, we go to the activation test, which is essentially talking to all the various backend servers, all the databases, and we do some tests there. Once that is passed, then we actually take that binary and publish it into Nexus Maven repository. So so and from that point, we have a we just build once and we have an artifact which we use for next step of the process. So then we deploy to dev machines, which is similar to production, but at a much lower scale. And then we run all the acceptance, acceptance tests on it. And then once the acceptance tests are passed, we do some uh, code analysis. Uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, the results of the code analysis that we do in the middle. And once everything passes, then we go to the next stage, which is QA. In the QA stage, we deploy to QA and we do some uh, smoke testing in QA. And after that, it goes to staging, do some smoke testing in staging. And then finally, it goes to production because at this point, we know that we have enough coverage in our test. Uh, so that basically gives us enough uh, confidence that things are not going to break in production. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. so when you say acceptance test, is that a different set of Yes, yes. So these are the acceptance tests. These tests are basically from the end to end tests. Uh, that so is it the same set of tests in each one of these environments? Yes, so same set of tests in all the environments, but they um, take a different environments. And, they, and they, have, they have different data. So, for example, like they have a bunch of login IDs in there, but in QA, they different login IDs. And information view. So you're basically testing the different uh, different data sets, and data sets and different yes. integration points. Yes, because th this data has different qualities in different environments. They have different data variables. We have to test all of these. So that's the 
is we have the same test, but so the I don't know if you can see the colors. Uh, the blue ones are basically all the quality kits. So the uh, our pipeline can fail in any of those blue uh, stages, blue jobs, right? If it fails in any of this stuff, it won't go further. It will just stop there, and then it uh, triggers a feedback loop. So somebody from my development team looks at it and makes sure that they fix it, and then the whole delivery pipeline starts all over again. How long did your test just, if, if, if everything works, how long did it take to run? Uh, so, the acceptance test, uh, right now I think it takes a few minutes at the most. Uh, because, most of, because most of our tests are concentrated in uh, unit testing and integration tests. So, the acceptance test we use, uh, we take the most used features and make sure that all of them works. Question? Yes. So what is the scope of the testing here? Is it just one, one microservice or the interaction system? The microservice. Okay. So, so the unit test tests the microservice by itself. Uh, the integration test, if the microservice talks to any databases or any other services, then the integration test test goes as well. And the acceptance test basically tests the whole thing. So we test all the entire spectrum. But, but the good thing about it is because we broke our system into small, smaller pieces, the number of tests that we run uh, are not the entire gamut of tests for the entire you know, uh, system as a whole. It's just a specific part that touches the uh, So that way we, could, we can uh, make the uh, much faster. So the pipeline implementation, uh, we use uh, Jenkins. I guess most of the guys use Jenkins and also uh, somebody using Go. Okay. And uh, does anybody else use Travis? Okay. So, so most people use Jenkins. That's by far the most popular one. Uh, I'll, I'll check out Go, Go as well. Um, and we, are, we use uh, Gradle uh, as our uh, task manager. So, so anybody uh, worked with Gradle before? So it, it's similar to Maven, uh, but it's, it has uh, uh, Groovy DSL. So it's much, uh, to me, it's much less workhorse. And if something is missing, I can quickly write up a Groovy script and then it will stuff. Uh, and then we use Nexus repository uh, to publish all our artifacts. And so that's the actual view in Amazon Jenkins. Well, Jenkins view looks like that. So when the job is running, it kicks off the process. So each row is a commit. So somebody commits, kicks off a job, and it goes through the entire uh, pipeline, uh, and then finally it's production. So if it fails, uh, it turns red, and then that sends a feedback. Uh, sends an email to the entire group, and also the developer, um, notifying them something has broken, and go ahead and fix that. So our technology stack is uh, pretty standard. Uh, runs on CentOS, JVM7. So uh, you, you can write code in Java, Ruby, Scala, it doesn't matter, as long as it runs on JVM. Uh, and Tomcat 7, Tomcat 7 is optional uh, because we have a bunch of processes that run, we say executable jars, we just run executable jars that uh, have embedded Tomcat or JVM. And we use Spring Boot uh, that uh, that takes out a lot of plumbing code out, so it, it uh, make, makes our coding much faster and creating a test case is also much uh, simpler. And we use uh, MongoDB and MySQL for our projects. So our source code strategy is basically to minimize uh, prerequisites for somebody to get started. So all we need is JDK 7, nothing else. So we don't, we don't need Gradle installed on the machine, we don't need Maven or anything installed on the machine. As long as you have JDK, get the code, and you can start the process. So what I mean by that is we check in enough uh, information with our source code that can pull all the Gradle sources uh, from remote and start off the Gradle uh, and then it gives the and that. So that basically makes uh, somebody somebody coming into the team. Makes them much more quicker, and they can start off coding uh, 
straight away. And we also, anytime we start a new microservice, we start with a walking skeleton, uh, which basically has a bunch of uh, stuff already in it, uh, such as metrics, uh, frameworks for metrics and health steps. Do you have essentially like a, a template or something that yes. you start every project with that, yes. that gets reloaded? Yeah, that's yes, exactly right. So we have a template, uh, which uh, hopefully once I have enough time, I'm going to open source it, take out any level of specific stuff. I'm going to open source that and check it in. But, uh, so it, it basically comes with all this stuff like security, logging, uh, on the deployment scripts, print scripts. So, so it's ready to go. So you can just start. start. And our source code strategy is basically we check in everything into master. So there's no branching, there's no merging, nothing like that. Everything goes to master. So that basically means that when you check something in, it's a candidate to go in first. So that basically means that you have to check in frequently, make sure that you don't break other stuff, and you have enough code coverage uh, to go to the next step. And the good thing about that is developers pick each other's changes immediately, but the bad thing is you might break somebody else's code. But we have enough checks in place, uh, which I'll show, show you a little bit later, that uh, we'll know f faster if you break somebody else's code. Uh, so that's why the code coverage becomes very important, because once we have enough tests, that makes sure that we cover all your scenarios. Uh, if you break something, you know it. So we tried uh, branch for releasing and branch for feature, but the problem with that is they tend to live longer than what we anticipate. And by the end of the sprint or the end of the project, when we try to merge them into the main line, it becomes an integration help. So, so we try to not do that. But for some people it works, but for us uh, it didn't work that uh, So the way, so if you want to add new big features, we basically use like uh, flags. So the each of flags goes on and off. And these flags can be enabled in QA, but disabled in production. And so we, that actually helps us well. So the, the final thing is we always try to write less code. So what I mean by writing less code is don't try to write code like this. It basically has lots of try catches, safe analysis, and do all the stuff that's pretty standard. Uh, so this code is basically, this code is supposed to get an input from a HTTP request and do something from it. So if you, if you write code like that, that basically uh, you'll have to write more than uh, six or seven different test cases to cover this because it has high cyclometric complexity. Right? So the same code can be written much simpler. Just like that. You know, if you use a good framework like Spring Boot, same code is just one, two lines. So, so this basically says, okay, I'm, I, I'm going to map to a URI called slash history, and it accepts a post with a request body. And once once I process it, I send back a response that looks like the history. Response. So that, so writing a test case for this is much easier than writing a test case for something like that. So, so that's what we try to. So, our, so the next topic is our test strategy. Uh, so the, our test strategy is, uh, somebody asked me the question about how long it takes to test. So we try to minimize the time it takes to do our unit testing to five minutes or less. So that basically means that we have to be very diligent in writing a code uh, such, such a way that it's, uh, it maintains a single response to what I mean by that is basically you write a class that is narrowly focused and knows what it's doing, and it does just that and nothing else. So once we do that, it's much more easier to write test cases uh, for that code. And that, so that way we can uh, we use stubbing and we use mocking to test uh, uh, five minute tests. So most of our tests take less than a minute. So that's what we do. And once the unit test pass, then we go to integration tests. And then once integration tests are done, then we would accept these tests. And obviously, we do like automated code reviews. Uh, and also the manual code reviews as well. 
the automated code reviews don't catch uh, all the scenarios, but it catches most of the uh, easily catchable scenarios, like somebody is missing, somebody is not checking for null, somebody is not uh, uh, doing some uh, like that casting and stuff like that. Okay. It's much more easy to pick up using automated code reviews. And the uh, build fails if any of those have all the strategies. So our testing tools, uh, we use JUnit extensively. Uh, we use Mokito for mocking uh, any uh, dependencies. We use QUnit for uh, JavaScript testing. So some of our front-end uh, applications uh, have extensively use QUnit and saving them for any acceptance and web testing. And we also use JMeter uh, for performance testing as well as acceptance testing because it uses a nice uh, we can just copy and paste what the request looks like, and then it's, it has a bunch of plugins that verifies what the response is. Why do you have to use Selenium? Because my understanding Selenium is for UI testing. Yes. So we have some applications that are UI based. So we do use uh, Selenium as so well. Is it not testing the service? Uh, it, it is not testing all the services. Certain, like the front end UI parts, uh, they just uh, use Selenium. But the backend stuff, it's mostly driven off JVM. Uh, that is the So that's the normal test strategy. So that's what ThoughtWorks. Uh, so we did a uh, basically a research on one of the projects that we did. So most of their tests are in Java layer, and it takes about a minute. And they have a bunch of uh, JavaScript test uh, tests that take less than a, uh, less than that takes about a second. And integration tests, even though they are far fewer, they took like eight minutes. And UI tests, they have very few UI tests, but it took the longest time. So that's the normal uh, time taken by tests. So we know this happened because we started off with testing at the UI layer, took hours to do all the scenarios. But then, uh, but then after we re-architected uh, so our solution, it looked something like that. So that's our real world scenario. Uh, this is like, I think, three months ago, but we have much more this now. Uh, basically, it reflects what ThoughtWorks had uh, done, research has done. Basically, unit tests take a few seconds, JavaScript tests take even less time than that, and the integration tests take a few seconds, but the UI tests take minutes. So the code quality strategy, so this is something before before we can push our code into production, it has to basically, uh, we have to have a minimum viable uh, code quality, right? Code quality strategy. So what we do is uh, we have, we enforce certain, um, uh, we enforce some of the minimum code coverage by unit tests. So the overall coverage of code, both the line and the branch coverage should be 90% of the So let's say we, we write 1,000 lines of code, but we basically have to test at least 90% of those uh, lines. Not just the lines, but also the branches. So if you have multiple conditions, it takes into consideration all the different conditions. So unless that is passed, it's not going to pass the code quality test. And also the new code coverage has to be 90% or more. So the reason we have the new code coverage is basically, let's say we have 1,000 lines of code, and somebody added like four lines. Right? So those 1,000 lines of code might be over 90%, but if somebody added four lines and did, did not add any unit test, it, the overall coverage will be still be 90% or more, but it will fail the quality gate after the new code coverage. So we'll stop them right there. So that just means when you write some code, you have to write some messages. And it has to cover 90% of all your branches and your plans. And we also enforce low cyclomatic complexity. Means that if your method contains more than 10 conditional statements, your bill will fail. That's as simple as that. So you have to basically refactor your code to make it more simpler. Uh, and then make sure that it's much more cleaner. Because 
the more complex your method is, uh, it's it's a brain problem because I can't understand something that has a bunch of nested if loops and nested while loops. It's, it takes too much time, so we can't. Uh, so it takes a lot more time to figure that out. So that's why we enforce that. And also we also enforce the code quality, like error handling, style problems, and ignoring conventions or skipping. And so the way we do that uh, is because we use, we use a bunch of tools, like we use the Jaco code for Java code coverage. So that basically measures. Uh, it instrument. It basically what it does is it instruments the code and measures all the lines that have been covered by it. It also measures the branches and and things like that. Um, the Java JavaScript code coverage is done by what uh, is called Saga. Uh, I don't know if uh, a lot of people use it, but that's pretty good. Uh, we found it pretty good because it actually gives us nice statistics on all the different uh, properties. So we use uh, the result of this uh, tools to basically either pass the build or fill the build. And then we use PMT, find bugs, and JDPen to find different issues, like poor quality and potential bugs. And if there's too much dependency between different models in the system, uh, so we basically break the build if any of those things. So thank you. From what I uh, heard, is actually have all the code analysis and yes. already. So what are the other tools? What is the right. So Sonar Cube by itself doesn't do anything. So Sonar Cube uses these tools to do the actual analysis. Sonar Cube is just a dashboard to tie all of this together. So it just uses that, and these tools do the actual uh, analysis, converts them to like XML files or things files. So Sonar Cube understands those files and shows them in a nice graph. So, so Sonar Cube, uh, how many, you, did you use Sonar Cube? How many people use Sonar Cube? It's, it's, it's an eye opener for us, basically. As soon as the first time we saw it, we were amazed to see how how we are lacking in the code coverage department, all the bugs and stuff like that. So you haven't seen it's actually used for the other Yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yes. So, it's an aggregate. It's so it gives you a usable way to say, oh, uh, and then you can drill down and go, oh, yeah. that's, that's right. the action. So, so some of the stuff that Sonar Cube does is like Jenkins gives you like a snapshot view where you can see a further build of what's happening, but the Sonar Cube actually gives you like a nice view uh, that basically shows you okay, uh, how is your code looking. Right? So that's the dashboard that Sonar Cube gives you. So it will tell you okay, what's your uh, uh, project and what's the uh, number of lines of code, if you have any issues, the uh, line coverage, the branch coverage, the complexity of the code, how long it will take to actually fix those issues. So it, it's, it's basically an eye opener for us because it actually pointed to a lot of issues that we didn't even know were issues. Uh, it was uh, very amazing. So it even gives you like a badges there. So if you see that green and red, red stuff, so those badges basically means green stuff means everything is good, red stuff means it's broken. It is broken because it failed a bunch of quality gates. Uh, so there's another badge that is like warning. Uh, uh, we don't have anything that has warning. So I intentionally uh, masked the project for a fail because I didn't want it all the work. But you know who you are, so it's <laughs> So it, it also, if you drill down into the project level, it actually gives you uh, final real details of how you're doing. Uh, it even shows you like how you're doing over time. So let's say you started your project like a few months ago, it tell you uh, if you're doing better, going up, going down, trending, and all that stuff. And it also gives you that like, code level. How, how does my code look like? So for example, this basically shows me I don't have any coverage. The red basically says I don't have any uh, code coverage in these lines of code. Uh, so I have to start writing the test cases to fix that issue. So if you, if you look at the line number 313 there, uh, it's one line, but again, it, it shows me that I have to write two different test cases because it's the eighth condition. So 
that essentially helps me quite a bit to write good uh, test cases to uh, cover all the different conditions. And it also finds a bunch of uh, stuff like unhandled exceptions. So I saw a bunch of code that was basically catching an exception and doing nothing, not even logging. So that's like a big course note, which again, you should not be doing that, but so it got that, so I just wanted to catch it. So that's the code quality analysis. And then, of course, the deployment strategy is basically we use Chef extensively. We deploy it uh, in Chef, and the system is built for like, zero downtime deployment. And the rollback strategy is, again, because we can roll back anytime, we use Jenkins. We can roll back anytime using a single click. So go to the previous version and say, OK, install this version. That's a rollback. So, so only few people have capability to go back, but everybody has capability to add new stuff in. So what I mean by that is they're checking the code, the new stuff gets pushed to production automatically, but they cannot roll back unless somebody knows what they do. Uh, and we don't allow changes directly to production uh, ever. So if we have if we need emergency build, it has to go through the standard of that. So that's you're saying no manual changes. No, no manual changes. Okay. Okay. Yes, it's really ineffective to have this whole thing and not be able to do yeah. yeah. that. That's the whole problem. So, yeah, that's the deployment tools are basically we use Chef and Nexus, uh, all triggered by Jenkins. And once we have this uh, applications, like microservices applications, the big monitoring becomes very important. So we use New Relic extensively. Uh, to monitor our applications. We also use uh, our in-house Argus and Koga metrics that do monitoring on HTTP and JMX. Uh, we have Java Melody and uh, we, we use uh, ELK uh, stack, the Elastic Search and Log Stash, to basically for logs and find basically uh, debug. That's what most of Uh, so we don't have, uh, so I know that the uh, uh, billing set of uh, they do some scanning. scanning. Uh, our applications don't have like PI information. So we don't necessarily do all the security scanning. Um, but there's a, so again, there's a plugin for SonarCube that has it. I don't remember off the top of my head, so I think uh, you guys uh, know, know that. Uh, so they, they So that's the snapshot of the uh, screenshot of Moodle. Uh, so it's, it's a great tool that I, we can actually uh, drill down into what each method is taking, how long it's taking, and stuff like that. So it does sampling of different methods at the real live system. So uh, if we have systems that, let's say, uh, the request originated in one system, went to a different system, and then forwarded a different system, Moodle can actually monitor all the stuff all the way through from one system all the way to the back. So it gives us a great visibility into what's going on in the system. Yes. So the API documentation. So so our API doc, because we deal with a lot of RESTful web services, we made API documentation part of our development <coughs> as well. So what I would think by that is we use uh, something like Swagger UI. Um, you can look at that URL right there. Uh, so we annotate our controller classes with Swagger to automatically generate uh, documentation for us. So, so it, before, most times when we did the manual uh, documentation, what happened is by the time somebody developer finished his uh, documentation, it's, uh, it's already out of sync with what's happening in that system. So with this, we have the ability to generate the documentation right when somebody writes the code, it's automatically. So, so this even helps us in creating much better interfaces. Uh, so that is very useful to work with. So, and it also has the great uh, capability of it can actually generate your parameters. So you can enter some values there and then try it out. It'll actually hit the actual server. Okay. Uh, we, we deploy this in our dev. So 
so that we can actually hit our dev server, get the responses back, and it's a great testing tool as well. So the takeaway is that we had was if it hurts, we more often. So that's <laughs> probably quite common. So keep doing it till it feels natural. So that's something that we need. And CD continuous delivery forces you to do the right thing, which is basically that means you cannot do continuous delivery without automating your everything. Like automating your building, automating your test, deploy, and release. And the entire thing should be done. And other thing is to measure everything, make no assumptions. So always keep measures. And the most important thing I think is it things go much better if you have an ops reference. Uh, we have a lot of uh, ops uh, input into when we started this thing. So they were very, very uh, highly enthusiastic and we had a lot of input. We had uh, exchange ideas and then it became much more easier to work. Uh, Alright, so, so that's uh, one of the quotes. So, so we had one of our colleagues, Chris. So he, he gave his um, team basically an assignment. He said, how long will it take to deploy one line of code? So I thought, okay, uh, let's see how long it takes. So it's actually from this book, Lean Implementing Lean Software. So, so, so I can answer Chris. So I can answer Chris right now. So uh, that's our real deployment pipeline. So we started, today we started at around 10.36 a.m. And it went through all the phases of our pipeline and we finish at 11 fall, so 36 minutes. I hope it was 42, it was 36 minutes. So there you go, Chris, that's the answer, 36 minutes. So, but, but the second part of the question is, do you deploy these changes at this pace on a repeatable and reliable basis? And I can, I can immediately say yes, because we can deliver uh, any changes to our production within an hour. So, so most of uh, the references that I I got are from the sources. So, uh, one of the big uh, sources is the Continuous Delivery book from Martin Fowler, or from uh, Martin Fowler series by Jess Hamburg and Farley. And also some of the sites, uh, the microservices.io has a pretty good uh, information on microservices. And also the presentations on InfoQ about uh, Gradle and about to do Fitness Delivery in general. Those were very good of my help. And we use Spring Boot extensively uh, for our uh, Java code. And of course, the last one is the Pearl Packet Net, which basically has all the, uh, it basically tells you about what your application needs to have so that it can be uh, scaled and be a good microservice. So when we did monolithic uh, architectures, so when we wanted to do any changes in any of our services, so because we didn't have a lot of test cases, because writing test cases for a monolithic architecture is quite very, very hard because everything is tied together. Uh, so everything had to be tested manually. So the regression tests had to be done manually and it took like a few days to actually figure out if uh, we didn't break any of the old stuff, existing stuff. Now once we moved into the microservices, we, because we know that we are pushing small changes, uh, because we are, we are literally changing like three lines of code or four lines of code. And, and we are writing test cases to make sure that whatever we change have 90% coverage and our entire code base also has 90% coverage. So with that, we are pretty sure that it's not going to break a lot of stuff. And so far, we, we didn't see any major uh, issues when we pushed it. So you're using quite a bit of open source. What are you giving back to the community? Are you pushing back patches? Are you 
putting out the news bullets? What's the roadmap for getting back to the open source? So the, ro the roadmap, uh, so we do use a lot of open source, which uh, we, we started looking into some of the stuff, like uh, we started looking into um, doing the skill the walking skill in open source. And so once we have to go ahead from our legal ops, because, because we have this old, um, we had issues with the legal for a long time because they yeah, fix that. Yeah, no, that's so, fixed, just don't worry about that. Yeah. That, um, I mean, that's a kind of like, I mean, we've done yeah. patches for Shad, and we've been contributing a lot of yeah, really, There's kind of a, this is what happens, a lot of this stuff is culture, not technology, right? So before, it's like, oh, you gotta go to a committee, and they gotta do a thing, and you gotta, you know, I think we've kind of shot all that in the face. And if you guys have stuff you want to contribute, you can just make it go on, and we can make it happen. I mean, it's, we, we don't want to dump random things out that are specific to us, but where there's patches or things that are wonky, or, you know, things that are awesome, I think we, we try to present those out uh, one other question. Uh, so you're using Shep for deployment. Uh, Shep's great for server state, not great for deployment as far as pushing to go down. Have you looked at using Ansible or something else? So we started looking uh, at Docker as well. We did we didn't look at Ansible. Or just create images. We just create images and just push those images. Uh, we haven't completely uh, uh, deployed information yet, but we're definitely looking at the I think across the different parts of the group, there's configuration applications that are encapsulated in various places, where they be RPM or whatnot, jump repo. And Chef, in some instances, manifests those changes out. A lot of people use Ansible to drive the actual getting it, you know. So I mean, it really varies across the project, which is, again, why a lot of this stuff ends up being more people thing than technology thing. But we have some folks that are leveraging the Ansible for doing some of that more. Make it happen, kind of work, as opposed to defining the configuration. Yeah, because we used a ton of chefs, and we just found it's not great for more of one configuration and, and, and some of the stuff we wanted to do, so we put that in the bottom of the We used some salt stack, yeah. that wasn't great, uh, so we, we're using a combination of the other things right now. Yeah, one thing I've found about chef is it has a lot of moving parts, uh, so everything has to fit in exactly right before we work. Uh, so we're definitely looking at other stuff. Uh, so we haven't uh, pushed anything production yet, but yes, But again, AOL is a, like a big organization, a lot of different groups. So different groups, there are probably a lot of groups that actually use it. <coughs> just that, uh, for, for all of our service, the objective is, you know, pass the addition of whatever triggers that, whether it be an API, an API call or whatever, the full soup and nuts thing is done. If that happens to use Shad, perhaps use Ansible, or happens to use any number of other technologies, launched a human involved, that's pretty much the objective. What's your ratio of people to services? Uh, <laughs> I would say it's, uh, we have less people than the services. Uh, it, it's always the case because we have a lot of services that we can support. Uh, the exact ratio, I, I don't have it on top of my head, but it's definitely so people support more than a few. Like one person supports more than two supports. Yeah, it's definitely more than one. Do you have any issues from if you're going from monolith to the microservices with uh, all the connections to your different databases and how did you address so, essentially multiple services? Or do you ensure that only one service works? you ensure that a database is only accessed through one service or? So, but, but, so uh, in some sense, uh, uh, monolithic uh, application uh, had one connection, one connection pool, and everybody could use that. But once we broke that into pieces, there are some instances, some services had to access the same database. Uh, again, so we, so it's still a work in progress. So what we do is uh, we configure it same properties. Uh, we are looking at like some config server that will help us uh, eliminate that uh, problem. Uh, but again, in some cases, it's much simpler because one microservice deals with only certain aspects and talks to like one one more service and one database. And the configuration for that is maintained in that particular service. And all the other stuff uh, doesn't have to be. In the ballpark, what, uh, how many services? How many services do you have? 
Uh, so right now we have about uh, uh, it's close to 12 different uh, services, different deployment units. Uh, we, yeah, so we try to group uh, services logically. So we have a bunch of services here. So we try to have like 10 different URLs in one service. Uh, if they are logically grouped, can be grouped together. And uh, I think about 12. We're not up to like thousands of services as Netflix, but we can we can see that if we have a large system, we can use it. Yeah. So back to the uh, So it's a two-part question. So let's uh, break it up into two parts. One is uh, let's deal with the exception handling part. So so the Spring Boot framework gives a nice way of handling exceptions. So they support something called a, a, a controller advice, which is basically an exception handler that's uh, at a higher level than the controller. For example, let's say you have your controller layer called a service layer, which calls a DAO layer. Regardless of where the exception is thrown, if, if you don't catch it anywhere, it finally gets caught in this exception handler adapter layer. Right? Once you catch the exception there, so what happens at that point is you can figure out based on the exception what happened in the system and return specific errors uh, based on that particular exception. And the second part is, why do you need interfaces and... Uh, no, 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 I'm not saying why you need them, I'm just saying uh, if, if you could technically get your code to run without it, is it better for me? Because I'm hearing things like, use write less code, right. and then I'm also hearing uh, follow frameworks, follow conventions, yes. history, follow the rules. Yes. So sometimes those two things can go down, and I yes. need to understand when they're, those two things are, are at odds, Yes. Uh, so technically both are not orthogonal to each other. They, no, can, no, go, they, they, can, they can go hand in hand. So for example, like uh, the Spring Boot uh, framework uh, that I told you about, it basically helps you maintain writing less code but still handle exceptions in a clean and nice way, which you handle the exceptions at a higher level. Than, uh, okay, so So in the, in the, when you define an interface, I usually define an interface not to throw any checked exceptions, always uh, throw runtime exceptions. So that way, the advantage with that is I don't have to catch any of that in my code or throw any exceptions. So it's, I prefer runtime exceptions or checked exceptions so that my code is much more cleaner all the way through. Okay, so you do write the interface you don't have to throw? Throw uh, checked exceptions. They might throw random exceptions, okay. which I can cache at a higher level. So, uh, would the same thing that, uh, that was working on this monolithic application so also work on this uh, microcode? Yeah, so, 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 so
microservices? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's mostly the same team uh, that actually worked on the monolithic applications. So, so it, it's a shift in the culture. Right. It, it took a while. Uh, it actually, it didn't take a lot of long time because uh, uh, when we explained why we need to move to that, everybody was on board immediately. And because we did the upfront work of building out the pipeline and doing automatic work, automatic uh, testing and uh, deployment and stuff. So now developers are free to concentrate on writing the code. You just write the code and then check it in. And they are assured that if they made any mistakes, it will be caught immediately. Right. Uh, so you already had all the patterns there, yes. like all the work done inside it. Yeah. Once you have the walking skeleton and your deployment pipeline in place, uh, it's much more easy for people to get up. But if you, if you don't have that, it becomes very hard. Because looking at your transformation, like, you know, completely manual process to going yeah. to complete our yeah, it's, yeah. it's not yeah. just yeah. easy. It's, it's not easy. It, it's right. not easy. It takes a while, but you need to have that uh, system in place where you have the deployment pipeline in place and your uh, base template in place. Once you have that, then it becomes easier. <laughs> yeah, especially you were uh, documenting the APIs. When you broke it down a lot of the services, the constituent parts, did you generally favor breaking it down into testable APIs, or maybe a lot of use of uh, like jars and nexus and kind of gradle based dependency? Uh, so we broke it down into logical groups, all the APIs. Uh, so when we programmed logical groups, uh, so what happened was for a given like profile, like a customer related API, that all goes into one logical group, and general related API goes into a different logical group. And now, once we had the initial framework in place, uh, we could use the Swagger framework and just annotate each of our controllers that basically uh, created the application. I guess my question was more about are you making use of that with the uh, via jar or <coughs> the API? Yeah. So what was your yeah. So some of the uh, some of the core functions such as logging, uh, logging framework, and the security framework, uh, we have jars in place that are used by all our microservices. And and if our so we it, it's it's case by case basis. For example, if our uh, some of our APIs depend on some other APIs, uh, we tend to call directly over this. But if it's common across all, all of the systems, we uh, take it out uh, and do its own wrapper and jar. Yeah. How long did you, this trans, transformation take? So, uh, so, we, so it took a while. I think we started um, last year. So it took probably almost nine months. Uh, nine months because we started very slow, uh, like as I told you, we started uh, slowly building these web piece, then moving certain stuff, taking certain APIs, and moving it into uh, Yeah, I mean, so, uh, compared to a monolithic application with the microservices, does it make it harder to like debug problems? Yes, you have to trace absolutely. Yeah, it makes uh, it makes very hard to debug the problems unless you have some sort of a uh, event-driven log mechanism. Like if you use uh, Elastic uh, Elastic Search and Log Stash, it makes it much uh, easier. Otherwise, you'll, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up looking at different different logs, and then it, it may be easier to do it on your dev server uh, because our dev server has only like, two instances of each. It may be relatively easier, but if you don't have the problem framework in place. So I have a question more on the process itself, right? So you said like there's a commit and then it goes through other pipeline and it ends up in the commit, right? So let's think about a feature, right? And let's say there are multiple people working on the feature mm -hmm. on supposing I'm using data and we can share mm -hmm. this stuff, right? So once that stuff is done, is there a process to do a check-in or is it just like I just do a check-in and it just goes through Right. Yes, so we follow the trunk model, which is basically you know, if you have, if you are assigned a task, basically started in the code, and if this code is not supposed to be uh, in production for a certain period of time, we have built in feature flags for that. 
and then you just you, you, you turn it on, turn it off, different environments, so it may be on in there but not in QA, and so on and so forth. So you're saying that will so the person will still build a feature, yes. but with a flag with inside flag, it, flag. you're checking the code, it, it might end up in production, but it's not, it's not visible. It's not visible. Yeah. Doesn't that cause few issues in production itself? So let's say let's say there are two Tomcat servers running, right? And your code code goes to one Tomcat server and you're doing a rolling start, but still yes. there is a start, right? Unnecessarily there is a start. Uh, yes. But okay. again the cost of the starting process is not that high uh, because we do rolling process and we deploy to production. Some of the process deploy to production like 10 times a day, three times a day. So, so restarting a server or creating a new virtual machine is not a big cost as compared to not being able to deliver something. Let's do, uh, let's do one more. Then we'll, uh, if you need to ask some questions, yeah, we'll just make sure he stands back there for like a half hour. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more. My last question. So uh, our entire server communication mechanism, we, we basically set over HTTP and set up service call. And then, so it points the same question that we asked before. So if, if we have a common uh, functionality between multiple services, more than two, what we do is we just take it off and create a chart file and then use that as a library. But if it's used by only by one process, um, that means functionality of a different microservice, which is called the There's no uh, JavaScript calling the service, and service call another service. Uh, we, we try not to do that. Uh, at most, one, one, le one level of calls. But once we get into that mesh, again, it becomes the same thing. Instead of uh, doing it in a monolithic application, we're doing it across the system, which is so I'll be back and ask you questions. Hey, let's give a round of applause. Though.